Welcome back to Passionate About Music Education, a channel dedicated to you, the music teacher. My name is Rachel Hardman and today I'm going to talk about how to help grow your ensembles. As music educators, we're always trying to grow our programs. We want them to become these thriving experiences for our students where we cater for everybody and it's a, a wonderful memory that they will have long beyond school. So whether you run a choir or a band, a string orchestra, a chamber group, a full orchestra, this video is for you. We have so much impact throughout the year on how we grow that ensemble and how we keep retention within our groups. I think it's really good sometimes to step out of the director position. You know, obviously if you're directing like we all have, you choose the music, you work out how the rehearsal looks, you're in charge. Sometimes it's quite good to sit in a band and be a performer to get that different perspective of perhaps what our students feel when they're in an ensemble without us even realising. I've been doing that over the last couple of years and here is a few of the key takeaways that I found sat as a performer, as a band member, that might be helpful for you to consider as you keep striving to grow your programmes over the coming years. The first point is really obvious, yet it's amazing how many people don't do this. Make your new members feel welcome. Not just on the email or however you connect with them, but when they actually turn up to the rehearsal. Go meet them, go introduce yourself, go introduce them to the section leader or whoever they're going to sit next to. Introduce them within the rehearsal to other people so that they feel welcome. Let's be honest, most people join some kind of ensemble, whether it's a sports or a music or a drama production, to connect with others. They want to feel like they belong to something. So it's really important that you get that right from the start so they do feel welcome when they arrive because they will be nervous, they'll be a bit apprehensive of what the group's going to be like, whether they're good enough to play in it, are they going to make any friends, are people going to talk to them, they already have all that anxiety going on and you as the director can really make sure that you ease them into your group. If you are super stretched, then assign a student or assign a member that does that welcoming every time somebody new, new comes. You're going to give that to a student leader. Make sure you welcome your new members. And that also includes making sure that they get on any mailing list. So if you send out emails about rehearsals, that obviously their parents get them, but you they get them, that they know when the concerts are, they know what's expected of them, they know how to get practice copies, they know how to what they need to wear for the concerts, all of that information is really important because if you're not sharing it because you know everybody else in the band knows this because they've been in it since maybe it's day one, then that student will never know and then they're more likely to quit. My next point is about how we manage our band. Obviously in September when we start a school year, generally is when we do our biggest recruitment and we have students who've already come back to our programmes and then we have new students arrive. So we kind of work out our parts and if we're truly honest, we tend to give the more complicated parts to our more experienced students which tend to be in the older years. And although there's nothing really wrong with that, if you have a fantastic clarinet player or trumpet player, who's a couple of grades down, who's as equally as good as the first player, then it's important that they get a chance to play because if their part is too easy and it's boring for them and there's no challenge or stretch, they will not practice, they won't play as well as they could do in the rehearsal. They may feel a bit of resentment to the other players that you're praising for doing a good job because you've seen their journey, you know that they've, they've improved and a year ago they can play that and they're going, but I can do that and I've been doing that for weeks on this part and you haven't noticed. So it's really important that you try to keep a balance between you know, existing players, how they feel as well as anybody new coming to the group and making sure that they have appropriate parts. If you're in a lucky position where maybe you have 10 people who all could be sat on that first chat or 10 people who are really you know, amazing regardless of their age, then think about switching the parts. So maybe on one piece, some of them play first, one of them plays the solo line if there is, and then maybe they play the second so that you're getting a balance so that you teach them how important playing all the different roles are, how having strong players on each role makes the whole group better. There's ways of getting around it and getting a buy-in from your students, but it's really just make sure that your students are playing 
and an equally challenging part for their ability. I promise the quickest way for students to quit is they get a really easy part that doesn't stretch them, they're stuck on it for weeks, play the same music over and over, then they go, oh, I don't want to come to rehearsals. People go to them, oh, do you like playing in bad? Nah, it's boring. Part's too easy, it's boring. Those are the words they'll use, it's boring. So then it actually has a negative impact on your ensembles. Is your conducting as good as it could be? Are you conducting properly all the way through the rehearsal? Are you just beating time? Are you being a bit apathetic because you're a bit tired on that day? We've all done it. Our schedules are so super busy that sometimes we're picking up a piece and we're kind of blagging our way through it really. And we're not necessarily conducting properly and we're not giving it full power. Yet we're expecting the students in our bands, on ensembles, choirs, orchestras, to be playing to their very best of ability. So we have to give them our best conducting. Because we want our students to be able to go and play in other ensembles or to go and sing in other ensembles. We want them to do music beyond our classroom right through their whole life. And if you sit and you in a band and you've had a great conductor and then you come and sit in another band and the conductor's not even clearly beaten and it's impossible to follow them and basically the band's leading itself, maybe the drummer's leading it or actually maybe percussion section's all over the place because of the poor conducting. And you go, well, where's the beat? It's really important that you do that work. And it's, a lot of us didn't necessarily have great training in conducting. Some of us maybe didn't specialize in that at university and that's okay. Uh, you know, it's a skill to learn and you can learn it if you can learn a musical instrument, you can learn to teach, you can learn to conduct. It's, it's not beyond what you can do. Of course you can do it. You have, you have to take lessons, study great conductors, watch stuff on YouTube, see how people are beating, and, and actually practice. Like, there are so many YouTube like recordings now of all the you know JW Pepper material, etc. etc. You can practice that at home. You can really think about your beat placement. You can record yourself. Watch yourself conducting. You know, really observe that. Are you clear? Are you as clear with your beats as you think you are? Often we don't realise that we're maybe not because we're so busy educating, teaching and making sure the kids can play that rhythm and that part, but we forget that we're part of that ensemble too. So really work on conducting properly every rehearsal, not just saving it for the concert. My next point is really you need to plan your rehearsals and I know that's easier said than done when we have a full busy teaching day and maybe all these groups you do are outside of the curriculum time after school, before school lunch time and you're trying to concentrate on doing that, thinking about your next lesson and it's easy for us to not necessarily plan those rehearsals as well as we should. Okay, so give yourself grace on that. But the best rehearsals are the ones where you do turn up and you have planned and you are organised. Really think about what it is that you're trying to get achieved in that rehearsal. Is it your sight reading through the whole piece to test, you know, how easy, hard it is for the students and then you run it from beginning to end or you work on a specific section of the music, whether it's that tempo changes or time signature changes that you're, you know, bridging between two sections of a music are you working on specific rhythm? Are you working on the ending of the piece? Are you working on dynamics? It's really clear that you know what you're going to be doing in that rehearsal because it will be more effective like our lesson plans when you're going in there without planned. Our lessons generally go much better. Of course we can adapt and adjust and be flexible. That's art of being a great teacher. But if you're not clear on what the rehearsal is, you will find that your students lose a little bit of interest because they're not really sure what it is that they're striving for at the end of the rehearsal. What are they trying to make better? And they want to come away feeling that that rehearsal's time with you, that the whole group is playing better, so that sort of sense of pride. That kind of encouragement to go and practice the part that they can't play. So they go, oh, actually the band's getting good, I better go and practice this bit because I can't play it. And I want to make sure that when I'm playing with the band, I'm, I'm not the person who can't play that part. It's really important that you keep the pace going and also that balance between talking and playing. There's nothing worse than sitting and counting 25 bars of rest, about to play your, you know, little trumpet part, whatever it is, percussion, solo, and then you never get to that. Or somebody, 
just chaps, 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 and you go, are we ever going to play our instruments? We're here to play. So there's lots of things we can do to keep that retention, keep that interest in our ensembles. If we compare what the students experience in sports, they will go to a practice and they'll work on drills and technique and maybe some kind of game strategy. So that when they go out to play their games, whatever sports that they're doing, they can then go and try it out. And that's all at a much faster speed because obviously January sports is like seasonal. So that their practices don't go on as long as ours. You know, if you're in a football team, you might just only play in it for a, a certain amount of time throughout the year. But we try, we try and go all year. So you do have to keep those rehearsals varied and interesting and exciting. Remember, students want to belong. Have some kind of reward system. I know I had students who used to stay after school after a really incredibly long day anyway to play in a band. And they were super dedicated and just wonderful students. And it used to be get to like five o'clock and they'd all be hungry and then have to get on buses and go home and be picked up. So we, we went and started buying biscuits to have at the rehearsal at the end. They would buy some, I would buy some. Sometimes their parents would make cakes and the students would bring it in. It just became part of the norm of our rehearsal was like the biscuits at the end was the exciting part. You've never seen children pack up music stands so quickly and put their parts away and their instruments away to get biscuits. And, but it was a great way for them to bond and to you know eat their biscuit and have a chat at the end with each you know, with each other and how the rehearsal went. So even small little things doesn't have to be a massive trip away, though they're fun. Or you know your ice skating trips, or you go to the cinema, or go, go out out of school for the day to play. I'm telling you, you will never see happier children than when they get to miss lessons and go out and play their instruments wherever that is that you take them. Just small things to, to kind of keep keep it fun I mean we want it to be fun this music is meant to be fun and my last point today is really it's still about what you can do as a leader and it's to think about the tone of your rehearsals do you turn up and your rehearsals are very serious do your rehearsals have humor are you sarcastic rather than humor and fun are you kind are you aggressive are you condescending and patronising when somebody gets it wrong? I'm sure at some point we've done all of them because we're human and we are tired and emotional and we have our own stuff going on. But the more we are bring negative aspects into the rehearsal, the more it impacts our students. I've been in rehearsals as a player where the conductor is quite sarcastic and patronising and as a newish member to that ensemble, and I don't really know them, I'm sure probably everybody else does and kind of just goes, oh, that's who they are and they don't mean any offense. It can come across as being offensive, but more importantly, it doesn't allow you to trust that person fully, which means you're less likely to want to play by yourself or, you know, be picked on because your section's not quite so good. So it makes you apprehensive playing and it puts a bit of fear into playing. And we really don't want our students or anybody, you know, any ensemble that we're working with to feel afraid of playing because that is the sort of start of the end as such. It means that they'll either stop coming to your ensemble or they'll stop wanting to play an instrument, um, which would be a great shame. So we have to really think about our personal tone and our own character and, and how that turns up in those rehearsals and you're going to get it wrong we all get it wrong and so forgive yourself on those days where you get it wrong it's okay to get it wrong on those bad days it's okay for us to make mistakes like you know there's so much pressure on teachers to be perfect all the time and we're not we're human and we make mistakes and we have you know ups and downs in our own life that come into the building regardless of how much intention we don't have of doing that but be careful you're not one kind of character all the time in every rehearsal that may negatively impact the growth and the success and inclusion of your group. I hope some of these tips have been helpful. It's always good to sit and think about the perspective of the player when you are the conductor and often when we're in those conductor roles we forget what that feels like. So it's kind of good to go out and practice that as, as great learning you see one thing that somebody does really well and something maybe you wouldn't maybe do in that respect and that's part of learning as a teacher is to constantly keep a value and good practice 
So um, I'd love you to share your good practice, what techniques that you use to help your groups grow and thrive. If you've watched to the end, don't forget to subscribe and follow. We appreciate your support and I look forward to seeing you again here on Passionate About Music Education.